hello fellow followers of Christ and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce and this is the authority. Hello and welcome to episode nine of The Authority, the series we are doing on the great authors of Western civilization and looking at the authorial authority of the authors in understanding their works. And in the first eight episodes, we covered the period from the pre-Christian classical era, so from the time of Homer, um, seven or 800 years before the time of Christ, up to uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, um, uh, 1300 years or so, 1400 years after Christ. So we cover a period of almost 2000 years from the classical period right through to the medieval period. Now, however, we're moving into what historians call the early modern period. We are now going to find ourselves in the 16th century, uh, the 1500s, which is the age of Shakespeare. But we're not going to begin with Shakespeare. He's coming next. But uh, for this episode, we're actually going to begin with someone who knew Shakespeare, almost certainly. Certainly, um, Shakespeare and this person knew of each other, and they probably knew each other personally. The person of whom I'm speaking is St. Robert Southall. And perhaps we should uh, begin by um, uh, clearing up the confusion about the pronunciation of his name. I was always taught and told that the way to pronounce his name was Southall, but it's spelt Southwell, S-O-U-T-H-W-E-L-L. And uh, several years ago, I was at a conference in England, and actually there was a, uh, a descendant of St. Robert Southall, and he said that he pronounced his name Southwell. So who knows how you're supposed to pronounce it, but whole old habits die hard, and I'm going to continue to call him St. Robert Southall. So who was this uh, saint? Um, well, he was a Jesuit, and we need to understand um, the times in which he was living, because it was a very dangerous time in England, indeed a deadly time in England to be a Catholic, and certainly a deadly time to be a priest or someone who sheltered priests from the authorities indeed it was punishable by death to be a catholic priest uh in england during uh, the reign of queen elizabeth i which is the period in which we're dealing here uh and was punished by death to hide a priest from the authorities so um so robert southall um was a convert to the catholic faith he was not raised as a catholic but upon becoming uh, a catholic he uh, felt a vocation to the priesthood and uh, went abroad and studied for the priesthood uh, in Rome uh, and became a Jesuit. He returned to England knowing that if captured, he would face torture and a slow excruciating death by means of hanging, drawing and quartering. And I'm going to let you do your own research on, on the gruesomeness uh, and slowness, uh, and barbarism of that particular way of putting someone to death. Um, so uh, he was born in 1561 or 1562 and died in 1595. So he's almost exact contemporary of Shakespeare, similar age, a year or two older. Um, uh, and we should know that in, in St. Robert Southall's time, poets were the best-selling authors. So we don't, the, in, in the day and age in which we live, where poetry is, is, is uh, anything but in the ascendant, we don't tend to think about poets as being best-selling authors. But the, the age of the author, the age of the novel had not yet arrived. Um, the, the, the first international best-selling novel was Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes, which was published, the first part of it, in 1606, and the the uh, the second part in 1616. So Sir Robert Southern's writing in the 1590s, so it's it's 10 years or so, 10, 10, 10 or more years before the, should we say, the dawn of the age of the novel. So in his time, in Elizabethan England, the best-selling authors and the best-known authors were either poets or playwrights. Um, and Sir Robert Southern, as a poet, was a best-selling poet and a, and a household name in lit literate circles. We know that Queen Elizabeth I was was uh, was uh, familiar with his poetry. Um, so he was, as a Jesuit priest who was also a best-selling author, the most wanted man in England, because, of course, he was a dissident voice that was being widely read. So... Um, uh, 
we and it, before we we're going to finish the the episode we're looking at some of Robert Southall's poems themselves but I want to look at the Shakespeare connection so in a book I wrote called the Shakespeare on Love which looked at the uh, the Catholic dimension of Romeo and Juliet there's an appendix called the Jesuit connection uh, looking at the connection between Shakespeare and the Jesuits and the Jesuit to which to, to whom he was most closely associated was St Robert Southall um so so Robert Southall was ministering to the Catholics of London uh, during the period that Shakespeare was in London. Uh, Shakespeare probably arrived in London in the late 1580s, which is around the time that Sir Robert Southall arrived in London. And until Sir Robert Southall's arrest in 1592, um, uh, he was uh, ministering to London's Catholics. Shakespeare, as a, as a, as a believing Catholic uh, and almost certainly a secretly practicing Catholic, we'll look at the evidence for that in our next episode, um, would, would certainly have known Southall on that basis alone. But there's, there's more evidence for them knowing each other, not least in the fact that Shakespeare's patron, the Earl of Southampton, uh, also, also had St. Robert Southall as his personal confessor. So, so, so the Earl of Southampton knew St. Robert Southall very well, evidently. We know St. Robert Southall stayed with the Earl of Southampton and, that, as I said, that he was the Earl of Southampton's personal confessor. Personally, I believe this in itself uh, is proof that Shakespeare would have known uh, St. Robert Southall. But they were also distant uh, relatives, distant cousins, uh, and um, we know that St. Robert Southall alludes to Shakespeare in some of his uh, um letters to the Earl of Southampton and we certainly know that Shakespeare alludes to St Robert Southall in several of his poems and plays so we can look at some of these now at the at uh, how Shakespeare alludes to to St Robert Southall in some of his plays so in the Merchant of Venice um we there's a, there's um three tests the test of the caskets the uh the test of Shylock and then the test of the rings and the test of the of, of the Shylock and the test of the caskets, um, the the way to win the heavenly reward of the hand of Portia in marriage is to choose the leaden casket, uh, signifying death, reminding us perhaps of a coffin. So the three caskets are gold and silver or lead. To lead is to choose death, um, and so this is the lead up to to this with Bassanio. Who's uh, uh, he's the person whom uh, Portia loves, and this is, is a thinly veiled um, reference to um, the suffering of St. Robert Southall. We should say the Merchant of Venice was written at around the time of Southall's execution. When St. Robert Southall was arrested in 1592, he then spent three years or uh, two and a half years in captivity, uh, being tortured on several occasions. Uh, upon the rack and upon a, a, a new torture device uh, that they thought nobody could withstand. And there's actually evidence of uh, one of St. Elizabeth's... St. Elizabeth, Mayor <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth I's torturers um, gave evidence um, that uh, Sir Robert Southern was put on this new torture device, which is supposed to be so painful that nobody could resist confessing under it uh being hanging there and refusing to give any information so great courage in this man so that being said in the scene let's look at this scene from shakespeare's uh, merchant of venice and see how it alludes to st robert Southall. bassanio says let me choose for I, for as i am i live upon the rack and portia says upon the rack bassanio then confess what treason there is mingled with your love bassanio None but that ugly treason of mistrust which makes me fear the enjoying of my love. There may as well be amity and life between snow and fire as treason and my love. Again, let's just take a brief break for this exchange here. That, of course, the love of, of Catholics is the, is, is the love of Christ and his mystical body of the church, the love of the Blessed Sacrament, which is banned from England because the Mass is banned from England and priests are banned from England. And um, to be a Catholic or to be a priest was you were charged with treason. So uh, then confess what treason is mingled with your love, says Portia, because he's upon the rack. He's being tortured for treason. Number the ugly treason of mistrust, which makes me fear the enjoying of my love, makes me fear the practice of my faith. Um, 
Now, Portia says, I, but I fear you speak upon the rack where men and force do speak anything. So basically, when you're when you're tortured, you'll make you make any confession, whether it's true or not. Um, Promise me life and I'll confess the truth, says Bassanio. And then Portia says, well, then confess and live. And then Bassanio says, confess and love had been the very sum of my confession. O oh, happy torment, when my torturer doth teach me answers for deliverance, but let me to my fortune and the caskets. Away then, says Portia, I am locked in one of them. If you do love me, you will find them out. Since this exchange between the lover and the longed-for beloved comes in the midst of an array of references to Southall's earlier work, so Shakespeare alludes to, to, to Robert Southall's poetry in, 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 in The Merchant of Venice, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that it represents a clear allusion to Southall's own recent experience upon the rack at the hands of a torturer seeking to force him into a confession of the alleged crime of treason with which he had been charged. Such a conclusion uh, is reinforced still further when juxtaposed with Southall's own words in his humble supplication to Her Majesty. And this is a quote from St. Robert Southall. What unsufferable agonies we have, been, have put to upon the rack. One so tortured is apt to utter anything to abridge the sharpness and severity of pain. Yet even an unskillful layman would rather venture his life by saying too much than hazard his conscience in not answering sufficient. That's the end of St. Robert Southall's quote. What else is Bassanio doing as he ponders the choices presented to him by the caskets if not venturing his very life in the choice of death, the leaden casket, over worldly temptations, gold and silver caskets? He is willing, willing to, quote, hazard all he hath as the casket demands if it is the only way to gain his love. The parallel with Robert Southall's willingness to die for his faith, hazarding all he has in his willingness to lay down his life for his friends, is obvious. Um, also, want to the in in um, uh, Shakespeare's play Hamlet, the long graveyard scene in Hamlet is uh, is a memento mori. It's a reminder of death, uh, and for Catholics, the memento mori, the reminder of death, is meant to remind us of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Um, uh, but we see in this long graveyard scene that the scene we all know, you know, with the Hamlet with the scar, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. This is a, an ongoing um, dialogue with um, uh, with. Uh, St. Robert Southall's poem upon the image of death. So we see um, holding the skull and ask, uh, Hamlet asks Horatio whether the skull of Alexander the Great might have looked much the same when buried in the earth. Hamlet muses wistful on the fact that even the greatest men in history must return to dust. So to quote Hamlet, Alexander died, Alexander was buried, Alexander returned to dust. The dust is earth, of earth we make loam, and why of that loam whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? Imperious Caesar dead and turned to clay might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Many of Shakespeare's contemporaries must have seen the obvious allusion in Hamlet's discussion of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar within the context of a memento mori with a verse from Sir Robert Southall's own famous po poetic memento mori upon the image of death. Quoting from that poem now. Though all the East did quake to hear of Alexander's dreadful name, and all the West did likewise fear to hear of Julius Caesar's fame, yet both by death in dust now lie, who, can, who then can scape, but he must die. Again, there are other allusions in Hamlet to Sir Robert Southern, but we'll leave it there. Uh, perhaps my 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 favourite is um, uh, is from King Lear, and there's a story a story behind this I'd actually like to share with you. So I was in Rome uh, on on pilgrimage, and I was by myself, uh, and uh, I had time on my hands, so I found a, an Italian restaurant. 
uh, and sat down to enjoy uh, dinner, an evening meal, and I ordered a bottle of good table, you know, uh, house wine, red wine from the restaurant. Finished my meal. I still had some wine left. So rather than leaving the wine and leaving the restaurant, I thought I would hang around. I was in no hurry to go anywhere. And finish the wine and do and, and read the, the book that I was currently reading, which at the time was the uh, the collected poems of St. Robert Southall. And I came across a poem by St. Robert Southall that previously I had not known called Decease Release. And uh, this poem is very interesting, powerful, because it's written uh, in the first person in the voice of Mary, Queen of Scots. And it's written in her voice on the eve of her execution. She's about to be beheaded the following morning on the orders, presumably, of Queen Elizabeth I. Um, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, many people believed, and most Catholic believes, was the true heir to the throne. And Elizabeth I was not the legitimate queen because the marriage uh, in which she uh, was conceived was not a legitimate marriage because uh, Henry was still married legally to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. So anyway, that's uh, Elizabethan politics. So uh, it, it was obviously in Elizabeth's interest to get this heir to the throne out of the way. Um, and um, so she probably signed the death warrant. So this poem is called Decease Release. And the voice is of, um, of uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, um, on the eve of her, of her um, execution. And, and the image of the poem is that in being crushed, uh, that her martyrdom will, will rise to heaven like a pleasant fragrance, like incense itself, um, that in laying down her life, there will be this sort of perfume, if you like, of, of, of martyrdom. And she said, I will be as God's spice, being crushed. And when I read that, my eyes uh, opened wide in astonishment and because I re was reminded of the lines from... King Lear, where um, King Lear says to Cordelia, as they're about to go to prison and face their own deaths, that they will be God's spies. Now, Shakespeare, as we all know, is a great lover of wordplay, of puns and plays upon uh, words. So God's spice, God's spies, the Jesuits. Uh, See, so this is their powerful thing about that particular poem. Or one of the powerful things is it, it's in the words... Of, it, of Mary Queen of Scots on the eve of execution, but it's in the first person. The poet uh, will also be executed in, in an even more brutal fashion for his Catholic faith um, a few years after the poem was written. And the Jesuits were known as God's spies because they, of course, they, they couldn't go about openly because they would be it's punished by death to be a Jesuit in England. So they were undercover working by day as school teachers or gardeners, uh, but also secretly ministering to the Catholics in their priestly functions, uh, celebrating mass, uh, confession, etc. So they were God's spies. But of course, once captured and tortured and then put to death, they were God's spice, just in the imagery that St. Robert Southall uses in this poem about Mary, Queen of Scots. So let's listen to this speech by, from King Lear. Uh, and see the intertextual allusion to the poem uh, by St. Robert Southall, Deceased Release. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news. And we'll talk with them too. Who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out. And take upon us the mystery of things. As if we were God's spies. And we'll wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Lear gets his desire instantly as Edmund orders them to be taken to prison. His response is one of joy. Upon such sacrifices, my Cordelia, the gods themselves throw incense. It is indeed difficult to read these lines without the ghostly presence of martyred Catholics coming to mind. The Jesuits were traitors in the eyes of Elizabethan and Jacobean law, but were gods' spies. 
in the eyes of England's Catholics. If caught, they were imprisoned and tortured before being publicly executed. Since it seems likely that Shakespeare had known Southall, and since it is even possible that he might have been among the large crowd who witnessed Southall's being executed, the words of Lear resonate with potent poignancy. Upon such sacrifices, the gods themselves throw incense. All of this would have been dedu deducibly enough without the deliberate connection to Southall's poetry that Shakespeare embeds cryptically in the midst of Lear's po politically charged words. We have seen how the phrase God spies would have seen, been seen as a reference to the Jesuits, at least in the eyes of the Catholics and Shakespeare's audience, but the connection becomes unmistakable when connected with Southall's poem, Deceased Release. This poem, written in the first person with Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, as the narrator, refers to the executed queen as pounded spice. Quote, the pounded spice both taste and scent doth please. In fading smoke the force doth incense show. The perished kernel springeth with increase. The lopped tree doth best and soonest grow. God's spice I was, and pounding was my dew. In fading breath my incense savoured best. Death was the mean my kernel to renew. By lopping shot I up to heavenly rest. Although the poem is clearly Southall's tribute to the executed Queen of Scots, its being written in the first person gave it added potency following Southall's own execution. Like the martyred Queen, of whom he wrote, Southall was also pounded spice, whose essence is more pleasing and valued for being crushed. God's spice I was, and pounding was my due. As a Jesuit in Elizabethan England, Southall had been one of God's spies who, being caught, became God's spice, ground to death, that he might receive his martyr's reward in heaven. Upon such sacrifices, Shakespeare exclaims through the lips of Lear, the gods themselves throw incense. There are other references to Shakespeare, to, to Southall's works in, in other Shakespeare plays and, and in some of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, but uh, time will prevent us from look, exploring still further um, uh, Sir Robert Southern's influence upon Shakespeare. And apart from his being a, a, a significant metaphysical poet in his own right, um, the very fact that he was such an influence and such an inspiration to Shakespeare is enough to make him of interest. However, I want to draw attention, uh, draw attention to a, a, an excellent book, if those of you want to understand so Robert Southall, uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more deeply. This is a, a book called Southall's Fear: The Influence of England's Secret Poet uh, by uh, Gary Bouchard, um, and um, in it he shows basically Southall's influence not just on Shakespeare, but on some of the other great poets um, throughout history. So Edmund Spencer, uh, great contemporary uh, of Shakespeare and Southall. George Herbert, uh, one of the great metaphysical poets. John Donne, another one of the great metaphysical poets. Richard Crashaw, who we'll be looking at in a future episode of The Authority, uh, were all greatly influenced uh, by Sir Robert Southall. Uh, that, that they're, all, they're contemporaries or near contemporaries from writing in Elizabethan and Jacobean in England in the uh, late 1500s, early 1600s. But two and a half centuries later, the great Jesuit poet Gerard Manny Hopkins was also greatly inspired and consoled by the poetry of this great Jesuit martyr who was canonised in 1970s, one of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. I want to finish the episode, however, with the short time we have left, with um, looking at one or two of Sir Robert Southall's poems, uh, beyond the one that we've looked at already, Deceased Release, oh, and Upon the Image of Death. And, uh, and this I'm going to be, be taking the selection from this book, which Tan Books... Um, published poems every catholic should know and there's actually quite an extensive selection by St. robert sutherland here indicative and reflective of the fact that i think every catholic should know the poetry of Sir robert Southall, and also the fact that he's a great favorite of mine um so just go through some of the uh some of the poems in here just by title and we'll we'll, we'll, we'll read from one to conclude mary, mary magdalene's complaint at christ's death um 
The Burning Babe, which is probably the best known of, of Southall's poems, often anthologized. It's a Christmas poem. Um, new Heaven, New War. And again, this is used, uses the metaphysical conceit, the paradox uh, that, uh, that the peace of Christ is the weapon by which we fight uh, the uh, the spirit of worldliness. New Prince, New Pomp, that the, the Prince of Peace uh, values poverty, not uh, pomp, circumstance and riches. The same theme is continued in Content and Rich. I dwell in grace's court, enriched with virtue's rights. Faith guides my wit, love leads my will, hope all my mind delights. So what is wealth? Is it monetary wealth? Is it gold or silver? Or is it grace? Do we what should we want to dwell in grace's court? Uh, it, should we want to be enriched with virtue's rights? Do we want to be guided by faith? Do we want our will to be led by love? Do we want uh, hope to delight the mind? This is the true wealth that causes someone to lay down their life for their friends and to lay down their life for Christ, as St. Robert Southall does ultimately in martyrdom. And there's a wonderful long poem of the Blessed Sacrament of the Altar. Um, and um, uh, again, this obviously is a defense of the real presence uh, in the Blessed Sacrament, which is under attack uh, at the during St. Robert Southall's time. So here, here we see St. Robert Southall, like that later great priest poet, um, St. John Henry Newman, um, using his poetic gifts to uh, to uh, evangelize and by way of defending the faith through apologetics, poetic apologetics. Another wonderful poem, Seek Flowers of Heaven. Uh, we should, that, that flowers we should seek are those that, that belong in heaven, not those that belong in the world. Um the Assumption of Our Lady, so again, uh, using his poetic gifts to defend uh, the doctrines of the faith from those doctrines that had become contentious at the time. A Child, My Choice, so his great love for the for the Christ child, which we see in various of his poems, and then Deceased Release, we've already mentioned about St. Mary Magdalene, but the one poem I haven't mentioned yet is Upon the Image of Death, which inspired the famous graveyard scene in um in hamlet and i'd like to finish this episode on this great jesuit martyr saint and poet and influence on shakespeare and other poets with his poem upon the image of death before my face the picture hangs that daily should put me in mind of those cold qualms and pitter pangs that shortly i am like to find but yet, alas, for little I do think hereon that I must die. I often look upon a face, most ugly, grisly, bare and thin. I often view the hollow place where eyes and nose had sometimes been. I see the bones across that lie, yet little think that I must die. I read the label underneath that telleth me whereto I must, I see the sentence eke that saith, Remember, man, that thou art dust. But yet, alas, but seldom I do think indeed that I must die. Continually at my bed's head a hearse doth hang which doth me tell that I yet mourning may be dead, though now I feel myself full well. But yet, alas, for all this I have little mind that I must die. The gown which I do use to wear, the knife wherewith I cut my meat, and eke that old and ancient chair, which is my only usual seat, all those do tell me I must die, and yet my life amend not I. My ancestors are turned to clay, and many of my mates are gone, my youngers daily drop away, and can I think to scape alone? No, no, I know that I must die, and yet my life amend not I. Not Solomon for all his wit, nor Samson, though he were so strong, no king nor person ever yet could scape, but death laid him along. Wherefore I know that I must die, 
and yet my life amend not I. Though all the East did quake to hear of Alexander's dreadful name, and all the West did likewise fear to hear of Julius Caesar's fame, yet both by death in dust now lie. Who then can scape? But he must die. If none can scape death's dreadful dart, if rich and poor his beck obey, if strong, if wise, if all do smart, then I to scape shall have no way. O oh, grant me grace, O oh God, that I, my life may mend, since I must die. And on that sobering and priceless note, um, I'll bid you adieu from this uh, episode of The Authority. Please do join me next time. Until then, goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.